challenge? Not challenge. Uh, in online spaces and an increasingly interconnected world. Uh, we'll have perspectives from theology, uh, feminist media studies, uh, science and technology studies, critical race theory and financial technology, uh, and, uh, or, yeah, uh, and I think it's going to be a really exciting interdisciplinary panel on that level. Um, each panelist will have 12 minutes, uh, followed by three minutes of questions, and then I think there's going to be a lot of uh, nice discussion at the end. Uh, so without further ado, let me bring up uh, Angela. Um, just let me get to that. Uh, so, Angela M. Suruji? Yes, yeah. uh, Angela is obsessed with Facebook, Instagram, World of Warcraft, and understanding how people use these spaces to perform identities that they otherwise cannot. She's a media studies professor at Cutstown University and received her PhD from Temple University in Philadelphia. contemporary examples, um, some theoretical ideas, and also um, some research that I've recently completed. So to start off, I think the most important thing to really realize is that whenever we talk about interacting, um, and specifically interaction online, that is synonymous with labor. Online interaction, all of it is labor. Everything you do from logging in to touching your phone and waking it up, that is all labor, all of it. So I like to have this bifurcation. Um, it's kind of drawing um, a little bit on this discussion of social privacy versus institutional privacy, but I've altered it and barred it a little bit because I think it's important to talk about social interaction versus uh, institutional interaction, which really, of course, is just social labor versus institutional labor online. And what I mean by that is that when we think about interaction, the kind of common way to speak about interaction online is all of the visible interacting, right? So did you interact? Did you like it? Did you post? Did you comment? Did you share? Um, but really that's just social interaction because every time you use a digital device you are also institutionally interacting, right? So when, wherever your mouse moves, how long you stay on something, what ads you click on, profiles you view that you're not friends with but you like to check up on because maybe they're an ex, right? This is institutional <laughs> labor, this is still interaction, okay? But we don't consider interaction, in fact we might even consider it lurking because you're not being visible, but you are visible, you're just not socially visible. So I wanna be sure that when we talk about interaction, we're, also, we're covering both at the social level and the institutional uh, level, because they're both labor, and we view them very differently, but they're actually quite similar on the back end. And if, if to even prove this point more, there was a really interesting article written by Jen Goldbeck where some research came out from Facebook that wasn't really about this, but it was about basically how they know if you think you might want to socially interact, like post, decide you don't want to socially interact, delete that post, you still, of course, institutionally interacted because any interaction with the space is interaction, right? And I think, to even highlight it more, if you look at a clip of uh, Facebook's data policy, they actually, throughout the site, if you go to this page, I just chose one paragraph. You want me to talk into that? Yeah, we're just... See if you can find space Spoiler. for it. Spoiler! Okay. It, it just isn't taken up. How about that? Is that better? Okay. Um, and so if we even look at how Facebook it carefully words this, they actually say multiple times in their data um, policy, it is to use and interact with our services. Because you would think just saying using our services is enough. 
but it's not. They're very careful to say when you use it and interact with. Because again, interacting with is just opening the window, moving your eyes around, and your camera can catch your eye patterns. That is interacting. All of those things are interacting. So I like to visualize it to say, if you think that your profile, and this is just happens to be Facebook, looks like this, it doesn't, it looks like that. Right? That is you. And so that, that can capture not just the social interaction, but when we look at that, we can think how it's also a warehouse for also all of our uh, institutional interaction. And again, when I say interaction, I really want to mean labor. So that is all of our labor, right? Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, they make the skeleton and we give it the life. We give it the blood, the organs, the skin, right? And that's, that's all of our labor. And so specifically what I want to talk about today is um, the feminized and the gendered labor. And, you know, we can talk about women's work at, uh, traditionally in the home and this idea that it's unpaid, it's immaterial, it's invisible, um, it's not considered labor. Um, and that's not even getting in into the technology discussion because we can take it back to when bicycles were a newer, newish technology. Um, and in 1895, New York World published a list of don'ts if you decide as a woman to ride a bike. Two of my favorite, one being don't cultivate a, bi a bicycle face, and second being don't overdo it, let cycling be recreation, and notice the word labor even appears here. Don't do labor, because women, of course, don't ever do labor, even if maybe you want to. And we can take it to when telephone operators were chosen to be women, simply because women, of course, naturally are better at emotion and doing the emotional work and the, the work of love and caring, so they were better at communicating. But this was also seen um, as dishonorable because they would be speaking with men, maybe flirting with men. Um, and so I believe it was something like before 1913, Italy was illegal to be both married and a telephone operator, right? Because that was changed. <laughs> so we can, we, we can skip over tons of other media discussions because we only have so much time. Um, and we can take it to contemporary discussions of things like selfies, which of course are very gendered performances where you're narcissistic um, when you're a female taking a selfie. And then two of my favorite articles from Women's Health Maybe the illumination <laughs> is ruining your skin, and favorite and also worst, um, maybe you're getting lice. <laughs> so, so this, these are all the fun things that we get when we pair women with technology, and specifically the technology of the selfie. And then, of course, when this is um, from the Herald Sun in Australia, when when men take selfies, they are being savvy. They're being professional. They're doing something that is furthering their career. And of course, it's not bad, right? He's not getting lice. I mean, maybe he has no friends, but he's not getting lice. And so a wonderful piece, if you haven't read it, I would really suggest if you're interested in this, it's called The Selfie and the Slut. And basically the argument therein is that because the selfie is a vehicle of making us public, it renders the self when you're, it's a female performed slutty. And I love this quote, the selfie leaks the self and the self itself is seen as leaky. And even in the bicycle example and in the telephone operator example, basically what we're seeing is that when, when women are made public, that is the direct link to that they're leaky and slutty. Um, and so with technology, of course, with the same kind of promise of empowerment that things like selfies and new media and even Snapchat of a more private offer us, we at the same time still get this gendered discussion of how are women using these technologies and what really is their worth and, and, and um, how can we critique them for being too open in these spaces. So uh, a part of my research is, was speaking to emerging adult groups about how they choose to use different platforms. I asked them to choose their favorite platform that they use the most often. And what I did with that is I had a very granular way of asking them questions about it. So how often do you post, like, comment, share, text, images, news content? Okay, so it was an extremely granular process. And I also, in the process, tested their personality types, their self-esteem. And so I have a, a few of the most interesting findings that I want to share with you. And I'm going to do it by platform because it actually changes. I don't need this. Because it actually changes by platform. So what we have here, and I don't have time to talk all about it, is also is talking about how platform tools and the choices designers make drive the types of people and the types of performances that happen in those, in those spaces. And that's a whole other talk. But I have, let's see my notes. So for Facebook... Um, women are more likely to do the emotional work of liking images and commenting on images. Okay, that's the expectation. And the women who use Facebook most often um, reported they're uh, tested to be more agreeable and more conscientious. 
Okay, so of course, because Facebook is very open, networks collapse, and so you have to, women feel like they have to worry about still doing that emotional work. Men, however, on Facebook reported being more extroverted. Um, so women cannot be extroverted in that space because it's so many of their networks coming together. Uh, now for Twitter, men actually very significantly post more. Uh, men very significantly post more, but women are still more likely to comment. So they still are doing the emotional labor. On Snapchat, I'm sorry, on Instagram, women are more likely to post images and to again do the emotional labor of liking and, and commenting. And lastly, with one of the most interesting findings I wish I could talk more about is Snapchat, where women are more likely to actually post, comment, and reply to text and images, and is the only platform where women tested to be more extroverted. And I think this makes sense because it's seen as a more socially private, although it's not necessarily more institutionally private. So across the board, across my sample of about 500 people, women spend more time in general on across all of these sites, which of course means they are providing much more institutional labor, institutional data. So they are driving that, hence the title of my talk. And across the board, women are also, though, more neurotic. But men have lower self-esteem, which I don't have time to talk about. We can talk about that more. But I ask them why they decide to sometimes lurk or not socially interact. Um, women always responded because they were afraid of interpersonal conflict, okay? because they were afraid that they would be doing the emotional labor wrong. Okay? Men, however, responded in, that it was their choice because text, text or images didn't deserve it, because they were bored, because they were too busy to do it. So there's definitely this differentiation here, again, by the type of labor expected of women versus, versus the men that I spoke with. So to close, just some of my quick um, conclusions. Platform privacy granularity paired with the afforded tools drive user labor and interaction, both at the institutional and social level. And women provide more social interaction data in line with traditional expectations of women's work. But women also provide more institutional interaction data, thus providing a new tier of unpaid, immaterial, and effective labor, as well as providing even more emotional labor that upholds the capitalist system, which of course is the definition of women's work. Women feel they cannot socially interact at times, while men choose when they want to be visible, but as Gillespie says, this idea that platforms lift us up is a bit naive because at the end, even when men socially choose not, they are, of course, also still institutionally uh, interacting. Thank you. Thank you. If you could stay up for one question, maybe. Oh, sure. sure. Um, all right. Uh, we're running a little over. Uh, so I want to see if we could get just one question. So what's the best question that we have right now? Uh, anyone want to try? Right. Um, in the beginning, you talked about um, how social media makes us more heteronormative. Mm. Could you talk about that? Sure. So a lot of my work has been, I actually completed a full um, structural discourse analysis of Facebook where I um, did a discourse analysis of every tool that they mm -hmm. offer. And so what happens is the choices that are made and the people who make them kind of bake in often very heteronormative ideal, uh, ideas. So for example, um, you used to only be, be able to choose male or female as your gender. Um, now they changed that, but at, at sign up, you still have to choose male or female. So, so they're definitely keeping that in the back end data, and that drives um, the news articles you see, that drives the targeted ads you see, um, and everything is very, you can't choose your race and gender, I'm sorry, you can't choose your race or ethnicity anywhere. But they have this thing they now call multicultural affinity on Facebook and also Instagram because they're the same company, um, where they kind of basically guess what your ethnicity is, and that's how they choose the ads to give you. And I think you can actually go on and get a certificate in multicultural affinity um, through Facebook. So I think what I mean by that is that the choices that they make provide for us a template, and we get to fill in the template. So we're only filling in the blanks, but they're making the blanks for us. And what that means is that just like a building where a door and seats are placed in a certain way that compel us to face a certain way, walk a certain way, um, social networks are the same exact thing. They provide the pathway, and we have to pretty much stick to the pathway they've created. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next up, we have Ricky Creno. Creno? Yeah. Uh, with Between Gregariousness and Governance, Social Media's uh, Cult of Debt. Uh, so. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Ricky teaches English and STS classes at Tufts and lives in the Boston area. His PhD is in comparative studies from Ohio State, um, and his research mainly intersects media theory and political economy. 
Specifically, he's interested in the history of neoliberal social thought and the ways in which it becomes embodied in telematic and web-based cultures and practices. Thanks, Guy. A recent law review article on debt collectors' use of social media to stalk, shame, and threaten delinquent borrowers tells the story of one Tasha Soames, a Minnesotan with a young daughter and a 2005 Chrysler Sebring on which she'd gone a few months without making payments. Chrysler Financial, her original creditor, quickly sold her debt to a collection agency called Cramacent LLC, which put an investigator named Vanessa Hummel on the case. Hummel began by reviewing Soane's social media accounts, a standard practice in the debt collections industry, which commonly harasses debtors over so-called unneeded purchases. Um, Hummel took things in a different direction, though, taking note of photos Soane's had posted of her daughter, and with an assist from a caller ID spoofing tool, telephoning Soane's to tell her how terrible it would be if, quote, something happened to your kids because you were getting hauled off by the sheriff's department. The article goes on to relate other similar cases and argues for updating the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act in accord with, uh, with technological advances of the last decade or so. Um, and this argument is plenty convincing. And for the record, I wholly support stronger protections um, for, for borrowers. But I also believe there's a much more profound relationship between social media and debt. Um, one that goes well beyond the creditor's use of social media as an information gathering tool and well beyond whatever fixes our current legal system might offer. Debt and social media, I want to argue, structure human experience in the same way. Time, social space, and subjectivity serve as key fields through which both debt and social media homologously condition human experience. So in an era dominated by neoliberal ideals of individual choice, market freedom, the dismantling of regulatory agencies, and the diminishment of the welfare state, both debt and social media serve as central techniques by which governance takes place. Um, so two uh, important recent theoretical texts underpin much of my argument. Um, Maurizio Lazzarato's The Making of Indebted Man and Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's Afro-Pessimist Manifesto, The Undercommons. Um, each of these has a lot to say about credit and debt, but almost nothing to say about social media, which functions on par with debt as a mechanism for social control. So over the next 10 or so minutes, um, I'll lay out a theory of debt's function as a social regulator and its role in molding human subjectivity to be optimally pliant to the demands of information age capitalism. And I'll chart not just the similarities, but the inextricable, maybe even metaphysical coupling of the social media subject and the subject in debt. The vital here will be an expansive concept of interest, right? interest as money paid, interest as a stake in some undertaking, as what holds one's attention. Right? Had I more time, I'd conclude with a few somewhat cynical remarks on the twin globalist development pro programs of microlending and universal internet access, but we could save this for the Q&A if anyone's interested. Um, by the end, I hope to persuade you, though, that social media operates not just analogously to debt, but that as our dominant mode of media engagement today, it plays an indispensable role in maintaining order within late capitalism's debt cult. So the debt apparatus itself has become a most powerful means of governing, that is, of keeping populations in line. Um, but this wasn't always the case. Um, historically, unprecedented levels of mortgage, uh, of mortgage debt um, famously toppled the global economy in 2007, 2008, and have only mildly subsided since. Um, student debt, medical debt, credit card debt are all at all time, are at uh, near all time highs and continue to climb. In the U.S. and most of the developed world, household debt is fast approaching 100% of GDP. Um, for Harney and Moten, this reign of credit is a reign of terror, a hail of obligations to be met, measured, meted, endured. And the problem goes well beyond household debt. The burdens and risks of public debt, national debt, and the debt-funded trading of exceedingly complex financial instruments by commercial banks have been increasingly shifted onto the working and middle classes through a combination of tax policy, monetary policy, financial deregulation, and bailouts. So I'm particularly interested in the way all this debt functions as a technique for conducting conduct and organizing life in neoliberal or late capitalist societies. In acquiring credit, one must conform to the socio-technical machine of debt capitalism. So as Lazzarato has it, the creditor-debtor debtor relationship constitutes a specific relation of power that entails specific forms of production and control of subjectivity. Neoliberalism, in other words, reconfigures users, workers, and consumers as debtors. So I want to spend some time unpacking the implications of this claim. 
For one, it means neither repression nor ideology need come into play. Right? The debtor is free, but his actions are confined to the limits defined by the debt he has entered into. Um, you're free insofar as you assume the way of life compatible with reimbursement. Um, so one important feature or function of debt has to do with the way it forecloses the possibility of a radically different future. So this will be the first of several points of resonance. I'll try to chart between debt, culture, and social media. I'll call it binding. Um, others I'll refer to as blending disindividuation and control. So binding captures the temporality specific to debt culture. Um, debt, Graeber says, is an exchange that has not been brought to completion. Um, or as Lazarado puts it, debt bridges the gap between present and future. So binding is a term that has been used to describe the way financial derivatives, like futures contracts, make current and future prices of a commodity, say wheat, um, mutually determining. Um, derivatives and debt are of a piece in, that they're so, in their social, social political effect, as they promote a future that is enough like the present for the exchange to come full circle. Um, put another way, they each propel the present state of affairs into the future, making it appear as though sustained inequality is an inevitable feature of human life. Um, debt, Lazzarato contends, simply neutralizes time. Time is the creation of new possibilities, the raw material of, of all political, social, and aesthetic change. So this is also the temporality of social media, um, which is exceedingly presentist in its orientation. A case popularized by Douglas Rushkoff when his book Present Shock explores the ways our always-on culture valorizes immediate priorities at the expense of long-term goal formation. Um, we see this in a number, of, you know, a number of fields of analysis of social media, but photography theorists point to something you know, quite similar going on in the new uses of images like selfies, um, not as documentation, but as principal elements in live network conversations or phatic communication. Right? The, the photographic image, as a result, belongs to the temporality of the mutable present rather than of the salvaged past. Right? <coughs> The so second important feature of function, uh, or function of debt, I'll, call, I'll refer to as blending, another concept borrowed from the theorists of financialization. These political economists describe how various securities instruments, such as credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations, blend different forms of capital into a single unit of measure. There we go. Back to blending. Sorry about that. In our neoliberal debt called different interests, desires, wants, and needs are all quantified, made transferable, and more or less homogenized through techniques of pooling and redistributed through a technique called tranching. Right? As a form of currency, debt erases the distinctions between and blends together all different types of owing something to someone else. All we have to do to acquire credit, to go into debt, is desire something. Right? All we have to do is express an interest. And once we do, that interest combines with all the others, meaning what's important to the debt apparatus. What counts is not the individual, but this abstracted something called interest and its ability to circulate among and within a variety of highfalutin financial instruments with more or less predictable price fluctuations and patterns of risk. Again, the special power of debt is to, work, is to work not only on the person, but at this simultaneous pre-personal and super-personal level. Pre-personal because the interest is something that's taken from us, some time taken from us preemptively before we ever actually possess it. And super-personal because it is, it's, an aggregate that in, it's in the aggregate that interests and behaviors of those with known interests are what counts, what's controlled for or brought under control. So this is likewise how our interests, preferences, and social links are spliced, distributed, and aggregated by social media algorithms that determine what flits across our screen next, what will be most, what most likely to capture our attention, keep us on the site, maybe even click an ad or two. The blending of debts then mirrors the algorithmic techniques corporations like Google and Facebook have developed for aggregating the array of data points they abstract from all our online activities so that they may better sense our interests and bolster their click-through rates. That what this amounts to is a new mode of capitalist subjectivity. What counts, what falls under the jurisdiction of debt and social media as governmental techniques is all this semi-conscious, all our semi-conscious taps, clicks, swipes, and scrolls. Capitalism's new media machine counts and commoditizes each of those pre-personal micro-gestures and registers them alongside super-personal aggregate trends. The takeaway is that the reproduction of subjectivity in capitalist societies relies less on ideology than it once did. So now all it needs is for us simply to stay social. 
Governance in the term, uh, uh, governance is the term Harney and Moten used to describe this new non-coercive, non-disciplinary strategy of power gaining sway in recent decades. Governance then names the mode of, con of conducting conduct specific to neoliberalism and its cult of debt. Its success, Harney and Moten argue, hinges on the gregariousness of the population. Governance only works when you work, they argue, when you tell us your interests, when you invest your interests again in debt and credit. Tell us what you want and we can help you get it on credit. Tell us your interest. Right? Next to debt, modern life knows no greater facilitator of human gregariousness than social media. What's on your mind, Facebook wonders. What's happening, asks Twitter. Share me, share me, screams seemingly every blog post, video, or consumer good we happen to glance past. Um, and we do, we do tell, like, share. We can't help it, we're gregarious people. And this gregariousness, gregariousness has become one of the primary avenues through which we're governed today through social media as through debt. It's not individual behavior that is controlled, but the behavior of patterns and aggregates. It's about control in the experimental scientific sense, as in controlling for, um, specifically here controlling for pattern variation. But what's new about neoliberalism is the way it harnesses the media paradigm endemic to it to govern what Lazzarato, following Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, calls the the individual, which is the complementary figure of the aggregate. Capitalism today possesses a twofold hold on subjectivity, says Lazzarato, um, this dual way of involving and exploiting it. On the one hand, there's the individuated subject, the person, the citizen, homo economicus, the self entrepreneur. On the other hand, is the individual, fragments of the person, intensities, affects, interests that function at the machinic level. Like Lazzarato cites the credit card as an apparatus in which the individual functions like a cogwheel, a human element that conforms to the non human elements of the socio-technical machine of the debt economy. The individual is subjected, Lazzarato says, according to norms, rules, and laws. The individual, on the other hand, is subjugated, is, is, I'm sorry, the individual, on the other hand, is subjugated through protocols, techniques, procedures, and instructions. The individual does not act, does not use, he functions according to the programs that use him as one of its component parts. Debt asks only that he function correctly according to the received instruction. So we're not quite living out the cyborg dream. This is not the human becoming a machine, a lot of transhumanism, but fragments, aspects, interests of human being loaded directly into the capitalist machine. So if I can repeat my thesis, that social media operates not just analogous to debt, but that as the paradigmatic modality of media engagement in the 21st century, it is essential ingredient in the reproduction of debt culture. It forecloses the possibility of a radically different future and mold subjectivity by dismantling the individual and distributing the constitutive elements of human life interests through the socio-technic machine of late capitalism. And this helps us to see why the libertarian ethos at the heart of the neoliberal revolution finds its perfect match in the telematic communications revolution. One, the individual can be totally nominally free while being nonetheless subjugated, as Lazaretto says, or domesticated, like the famously gregarious sheep who instinctively limits its grazing to small parcels of land. In the lexicon of sheep husbandry, this is known as hefting. Right? No need for fences here. Thank you. All right, so we have one time for one question, and I'm gonna ask you to just repeat the question. Okay. Uh, does anyone have one question? All right. Um, we can talk more about that later. Uh, next up, we have Marika, um, who will be talking about. Let's see. Where are we? <coughs> Here we go. Uh, Marika, who will be giving a presentation entitled "Deus in Machina: Digital Capitalism." and technological reenchantment. Uh, Maria, uh, Marika uh, teaches, uh, teaches? Uh, philosophical theology at the University of Winchester um, and is particularly interested in uh, theological forms in secular society and the idea of capitalism as a religion. Um, she's working on a project right now on uh, angels and cyborgs, so. It seemed for a while as though the appearance of capitalism meant that mystery and mysticism alike were gone from the world, or at least doomed to extinction. The secular age of Western modernity was always also a machine age. The death of God and the mechanisation of the world developed in tandem with one another. But what I want to suggest over the next few minutes is that magic did not, after all, disappear from this new world. 
Instead, it found itself transposed in new, into new forms, new bodies, and new powers. Recent discussions of technology and digital culture, both popular and academic, have taken a curious turn towards magical and religious concepts in order to describe the new world being networked together with digital tools. From the Haunted Machines Project, which explores narratives of myth, magic, and haunting around technology, to Reverend Joey Talley, a Wiccan witch who works to make protective charms or expel mischievous spirits from computer systems. From political theologians who speak, seek to understand the algorithmic circulation of money in global computer networks as worship, to the theorists who sought to explain devotion to Apple products as a new form of religion. To grapple with the world we inhabit under digi digital capitalism is, more and more, to find oneself caught up in the language of magic, religion and enchantment. So I want to suggest that it's worth revisiting the magical world that we once seem to have left behind in order to better understand the emergence of technological magic. In predominantly Christian Europe, enchantment was always as much about mysticism as it was about magic. A universe in which everything that was pointed not only to other things, but also to God. A world in which everything was connected to everything else, but everything was also arranged in a hierarchy, which ran from God at the top, then down from angels to humans to animals to plants to inanimate objects. What held everything together in this mystical, magical universe was the desire of God, God's overflowing love, which moved outwards from God's being into the act of creation, and then returned to God as the world was create, redeemed and perfected. It was a divine economy, not yet in the contemporary sense of a system in which money circulates, but in the older sense of a big circle, a movement that always gets completed, an exodus and then a return. What circulated in this economy was God's overflowing love, the excess of divine desire, a surplus of joy. But what was sustained by the ordering of this economy was hierarchy, an unequal distribution of power. The transition from feudalism to early industrial capitalism was marked by the enclosure not only of common land, but also of individual bodies from the world in which they lived and of the world itself from God. As the world was disenchanted, so too were the elements of human life and work divided and separated from one another in the school, the home, the factory and the prison. In place of the world as mystical body, animated by the endless desire of God, driven to transcend itself in pursuit of the beatific vision, emerged a new vision of the body as a machine, as clock-like matter, animated by the insatiable desire of the capitalist, driven to overcome the limitations imposed by the rising and setting of the sun or the weakness of the limbs in pursuit of surplus value. Yet with this newly mechanised society came also the shift from tools to machines, the shift from the workshop to the factory to the global network, from a system of sovereignty to a disciplinary society to a society of control, the shift from accumulation to circulation. What we see in late capitalist digital economies, I want to suggest, might be understood as a process of technological re-enchantment, or, as Maurizio Lazzarato has it, a machinic animism. The emergence of a networked, interconnected global system, curiously similar to the kind of mystical universe inhabited by medieval Christians, albeit one which circles, cir circles around money and the generation of surplus value, profit, rather than God and the generation of glory, praise. I want to suggest that enchantment is a helpful way of thinking about this new world which is emerging via digital technologies, a world in which everything is connected to everything else by unseen occult forces. More and more we rely in our day-to-day -day lives on technologies that operate according to unseen forces we neither understand nor control. Our cars, our phones, our kitchen appliances, everything. As Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And it's not just our tools that are run by algorithms beyond our grasp. The global economy runs on financial transactions that take place roughly 500 times faster than the conscious mind can function. We might think that we're in control of our lives, but increasingly we're at the mercy of enormous systems that no individual can master, that operate increasingly independently of human intention. As the philosopher Bifo says, we have made our own God and it terrifies us. 
We talk about the economy like we once talked about God or the fates. We submit ourselves to the will of the market. We don't understand. We can't keep up. We can't control it. These affinities show up especially in contemporary forms of work in digital economies, in the shift away from the modern focus on the individual towards the centrality of desire, eros, the circulation of value, and in the return of the soul to the centre of work. Where disenchantment was marked by the emergence of the Enlightenment individual, the exemplary white wealthy man declaring the death of God even as he usurped his role as sovereign ruler of the world, the growing autonomy of the circulation of capital has meant the slow unsettling of this model of selfhood. While individuals under this late form of capitalism continue to conceive of ourselves as rational, sovereign subjects, in control of ourselves as human capital, the processes of production function increasingly independently of human intention, according to what Lazzarato calls the asignifying semiotics of stock market indices, mathematical equations and diagrams, which do not involve consciousness and representations and do not have the subject as referent. A second characteristic of the process of disenchantment was the transformation of a world understood to be driven by the desire of God into a regularised and rational machine, driven not by inherent meaning and purpose, but by the will to power of human beings. In his book, Willing Slaves of Capital, Frederick Laudon argues that capitalism must be grasped not only in its structures, but also as a certain regime of desire. Where earlier forms of capitalism could rely on the motivating power of our desire to avoid the unhappiness that comes with unemployment and penury, late capitalism requires a more total enlistment of individuals in pursuit of its goals. The worst of this capitalist enlistment of desire is visible, Laudon argues, in the service sector, which not only commands employees to show the required emotions, but aims at the ultimate behavioural performance in which the prescribed emotions are no longer merely outwardly enacted, but authentically felt. Franco Bifo Baradi's Soul at Work argues that while the early stages of capitalism required an alienation of the worker from her body, precisely so that she could be induced to view it as property to be sold, the growing importance of co cognitive capitalism, service work and effective labour to the contemporary economy represents a new form of alienation in which the soul itself is put to work. We go to work not only to earn a salary, but to work on ourselves, to work on our souls. What emerges from this new regime of holistic alienation is, he suggests, a new virtual class who have liberated themselves from the constraints of their physical bodies whose existence, who are physically removed from other human beings, whose existence becomes a factor of insecurity, though ubiquitous, virtually present in any possible place, according to their desires. The removal of corporeality is a guarantee of endless happiness for these privileged few, Baradi says, but naturally a frigid and false one, because it ignores or rather removes corporeality. And just as the disembodied contemplative life of the elite spiritual class of monastic men in medieval Christian Europe was made possible by the hard manual labour of those living the less elevated active life. So too is the charmed life of tech billionaires enabled by the badly paid back-breaking drudgery of Silicon Valley cafeteria workers, content moderators in the Philippines, click farmers in Bangladesh and MMORPG gold farmers in China. So we are back in a kind of enchanted world in some ways remarkably like the mystical cosmos of medieval Christian Europe, except that this time it is clear that we enchanted it ourselves and that the real force is profit, finance, a rapacious and unforgiving God. Just as the mystical economy of divine eros enabled the glory of God to circulate freely whilst holding its human actors rigidly in their place in the divinely appointed economy, so too in this new economy, the free circulation of capital is enabled precisely by the removal of that freedom for human beings. What would the trickle down economy of late capitalism be without the hierarchical ordering of borders? I've wanted to draw attention to the theological character of this new configuration, because in contrast to the more anarchic connotations of magic, theology is always about power and the worship of power. 
but the distinction between theology and magic has always also been unstable. To claim that a person is performing magic rather than miracles is always a value judgment. To accuse someone of witchcraft <coughs> is to say that they are the wrong person or drawing on the wrong powers or doing so in the wrong way. Magic is a form of resistance to the powers that be because it seeks to set up alternative forms of connection and power, because it refuses to pay tribute to the existing order of things. Both magic and mysticism draw on the connections between things, the community of all beings. Karen Gregory writes about the weird solidarity that is being created among us by the data economy as global algorithmic processes catches up into complex networks of connection with one another. And I want to end by asking what it might look like to recognize and to build weird, witchy, and heretical solidarities. What other gods might we worship than money? What networks of entanglement might we draw on to gain power for resistance? For our struggle, as the Bible says, is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one question. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah, go for it. Uh, great talk, thank you. Um, I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about desire and how you see the relationship between like a religious desire for God and this capitalist desire either to consume or to accumulate, um, and whether you see those desires as similar or not, how so? So the question is about um, the relationship between desire and the kind of Christian model of the world and desire and capitalism. Um, and I guess that the analogy that I see is that um, in kind of classical Christian theology, we desire all sorts of things in different ways, but ultimately our desire should lead us back to God and what it should enable is the continuous circulation of glory. So we see the world and it's beautiful, that points us towards the worship of God. And the goal is to kind of uh, become increasingly less reliant on anything other than just the circulation of like glory and worship. And I think that there's something similar going on in capitalism. So our desires are caught up and what ultimately the goal is, is to just get uh, surplus value kind of circulating endlessly in a way that's not really anything to do with the particular kind of things that spark our desire. So the goal is just this kind of constant circulation of desire. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to bring up our final presenter, uh, Guerra Kiwana, who's going to be giving a presentation entitled Telecoms to the Rescue. Uh, what is the role of mobile money platforms in providing financial services? An exploration of M-Pesa in Kenya. Uh, I think you can just escape that and then I, mean, I think it's pulled up on so you can just go to the <coughs> Guerra is a third culture kid and co-founder of Afro Fintech Hyper Africa, which works to help Africans in the diaspora send money and invest money home. She is passionate about financial inclusion, civic engagement, and tech-related innovation in sub-Saharan Africa. She lives and works between Toronto, Nairobi, and Kampala. <clears throat> cool. Hi. Uh, so I'm uh, Guerra. Uh, my Twitter handle is who is Guerra. I just added that. Um, so I am what Guy just said is a third culture kid. I grew up uh, in various different places, mostly in Africa, uh, Europe, and Canada. Um, most of my formative years were in Canada. Uh, and I've recently gone back to Kenya uh, and East Africa to work there um, and start a company, which uh, through that I learned a lot about um, finance and fintech and, and uh, financial inclusion. So earlier today, a lot of the spe speakers have talked about uh, the global north. And um, I'm going to shed some light on the global south and use Kenya as an example. Uh, so Kenya is uh, a little country, big country actually, in East Africa. Um, incredibly large population, uh, very innovative uh, environment. Um, and I'm here to talk about mobile money, uh, which is, so who here uses Venmo uh, or uh, PayPal? So before Venmo was a thing, in Kenya 10 years ago, something called M-Pesa showed up, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that shortly. 
So in the tech world, we talk a lot about disruption. It's like the big key, like big buzzword. Um, fintech is a disruptive form of technology, uh, disrupting finance. Uh, but in Kenya, disruption is not really what is happening. What is happening is innovation. So there's a lot of room for space. Uh, there's a lot of space for innovation in East Africa because a lot of uh, what tech is doing is actually building structures and building systems that didn't exist before. Um, so fintech is uh, innovating financial services um, and not disrupting financial services in Kenya. Uh, so you can look at this in two ways. There's, there's traditional banking. So who here is a bank account? We all have bank accounts. Uh, in Kenya, in well, sub-Saharan Africa, less than 25% of the population has a bank account. So this leaves a lot of room for a lot of cool things to happen. Um, I can't really talk about Africa without touching on neocolonialism. Uh, so Western systems and practices have long been uh, considered uh, the benchmark for progress in Africa. Uh, so with the exception of financial services, um, this is something that has, like bank, traditional banks have tried to uh, be benchmarked by North, Ameri North American European practices and standards but this is being heavily innovated on in Africa. Um, and Kenya specifically is very susceptible to uh, financial service innovation uh, because the majority of Kenyans are unbanked. These are people who are living in what is called a prepaid economy. So this means that 96% um, you know, of, of the people, who, of phone, phone users are using prepaid top-up cards to, to top up their phones. Uh, services like water and electricity uh, even solar power are used on a pay-per-use basis. Um, so this is, again, leaves a lot of room for innovation, a lot of, and even now we're just skimming the surface of what's going on. So I'm going to talk about M-Pesa, uh, which, which is what I was using. Actually, when I, when I got the email that I was uh, going to be presenting here today, I was paying with my phone for a meal with my parents using M-Pesa. So when I'm in Kenya, I don't use cash. I don't carry cash with me. Um, I use my mobile phone, and I can use a smartphone or even a feature phone, think Nokia 3310. Um, so mobile money wallets like M-Pesa have leapfrogged traditional banking to offer financial services to Kenyans, offering a wider reach to users than any traditional bank in sub-Saharan Africa. They're usable by anyone with any kind of mobile phone. Very easy to use, uh, and it's disrupting itself even sometimes. Uh, they actually, there's a lot of companies that are starting up different apps that let you do weird and wonderful things with your M-Pesa account. You can pay for a taxi, like a, like a, a public transit with your M-Pesa. Um, there's even like tap services like, uh, that, are, that are being innovated, that are being uh, created right now to, to disrupt M-Pesa also. Um, so M-Pesa has grown, uh, has since grown in the past 10 years into a ubiquitous service that allows uh, users to store money, um, save, uh, sorry, uh, send money, which was initially what it was used for, so send P2P transfers, which actually is happening in India right now, and everyone's making a big fuss about it because uh, WhatsApp is uh, allowing people to send money from your WhatsApp to your friend's WhatsApp, which is not that big a deal because it's been happening in Kenya for the past decade. <laughs> um, so uh, MPS allows you to store money, uh, save money even, you can have a savings account, purchase goods and services, take out microloans, uh, transfer money to other mobile phones and uh, use it for other like public services like hospitals, uh, even restaurants, even the fruit stand by my house in Nairobi, I use my M-Pesa uh, at their, they don't have a POS, they don't have a point of sale system. Uh, I just use my phone uh, to send the lady my 50 shillings for uh, an apple. Uh, so, the M-Pesa has become really successful because, uh, like I said, 20, less than 25% of Africans have a bank account. Um, so traditional banking has tried to get people to participate and be included financially by, you know, offering more uh, ATMs and, and building more bank branches. But this hasn't really done much. This is, you know, people, it's really expensive to have a bank account. Like I mentioned, there's a prepaid economy. All these annual fees can they can rack up and they do tend to be very expensive. M-Pesa has uh, the way their success was uh, rooted in the way they piggybacked onto in, uh, existing infrastructure to create a network 
of over 100,000 uh, M-Pesa agents. So these are people who, um, you know, if I need to take out money or put money onto my M-Pesa account, I just walk across the street to an M-Pesa agent and uh, I can immediately put money on my account. I can immediately receive money. Uh, even if I don't have a phone, my neighbor has a phone. And like, it, this is also allowed for more uh, community, stronger ties. Um, So where did M-Pesa come from? M-Pesa actually was built by Kenya's largest uh, telecommunications company named Safaricom. Safaricom is massive. These guys are huge. Uh, a lot of user, a lot of p people who have phones in Kenya are using Safaricom. It is kind of scary how big Safaricom is, but you know what? They've innovated and they've done a lot of really cool stuff, especially M-Pesa. Um, but because uh, Safaricom is so large uh, and it's a large capitalist company, um, we are faced with some problems because the feds is watching, mm. always. Um, <laughs> so banks are regulated by the central, by the central bank uh, of, of the country. M-Pesa is not. So their role, so the role of a central bank is to maintain function, financial stability and protect citizens in the nation, nation's economy. Now, at a point when M-Pesa was, was gaining traction and, and growing and a lot of more people were starting to use it, the central bank was like, hmm, you guys uh, look like a bank, you act like a bank, uh, we should regulate you like a bank. And M-Pesa was like, no. And the central bank was like, watch us. And then they decided to try and do that and then they realized, wait, hang on, 44% of Kenya's GDP, that's almost half of Kenya's GDP, is transacted through M-Pesa every year. So, Kenyans uh, now send, like, send money, buy goods and services, uh, get credit also, uh, save money with their mobile phones. And for a service that behaves like a bank, uh, there's unregulated, uh, there is a, there's the threat of something wrong happening. We can all, our imaginations are quite wild. I'm sure we can think about what could happen in that situation. Um, the lack of regulation uh, makes up for a recipe of potentially dangerous situation. Um, so Ricky talked about <laughs> debt and uh, credit in the global north. Um, I'll preface my next point with saying, uh, with stating a Nigerian proverb that says, "Lending is the firstborn of poverty." Now, in in Africa and most of the global south that has been colonized, uh, they are these, these countries are in heavily, heavily in debt, indebted to the countries of the global north. Global north. Uh, we've seen the effects of credit, credit and debt uh, from traditional banks and international institutions plastered all over the news, Eurozone crisis, 2008 housing market crash, the list goes on. Uh, regulated banking has done a great deal to harm many and protect few. Uh, and as M-Pesa doles out microloans to mostly financially illiterate people, uh, they are not, they're still not regulated by the bank. So this, is, this poses a significant threat. Um, but on, not to be a super pessimist, I still think that M-Pesa is quite good because a report came out at the beginning of this year that said uh, that two percent of Kenyan households since two thousand and eight have been lifted from poverty, and that that can be directly pointed at. Uh, you can point at M-Pesa for that. So two percent of households lifted out of poverty because of M-Pesa. Uh, so this is that's over one hundred ninety thousand families, um, and most of these families, most of these households are ran by women. So um, that's a whole other conversation we can have about uh, women and matriarchs uh, controlling funds um, and gaining prosperity for their families. Um, it's interesting to look at the fact that the most, uh, the most change wasn't created by crazy disruption and all these new age ideas. It was just allowed, giving people the ability to participate and be uh, included in the economy. Um, so simple things like money transfer have done a great deal to um, allow people to participate in their economies. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna end with one more thing. Um, so I'm, I'm sure not, not a lot of people know about this, but uh, in Cameroon, a uh, country in West Africa, the, they have had a digital curtain brought down on the east, uh, sorry, um, the southern, northwestern and southwestern uh, parts of the country. Um, these are mostly Anglophone areas. Uh, there's been no internet for almost 90 days. Uh, so just think about that. Think about the fact that there's people who have not been able to use their, their businesses, schools, hospitals, just not able to use the internet. 
So if you guys can all tweet at some point throughout the day or even throughout your lives until it's back on, uh, hashtag bring our internet back. Uh, that can do, do a great deal to bring um, eyes to the plight of the Anglophone Cameroonians. Um, all right, I want to make space for one Guerra specific question and then also invite the rest of the panelists to come up for the final discussion. Um, all right, in the back. I wonder uh, if you could speak a little bit about um, your understanding of the context of Kenya that it in some way enabled this. It's really extraordinary thing to, to bloom. And if you want to talk specifically about women's rights, um, that would be. Um, so she. Her, your, 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 your name, sorry? Your name? My name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth just asked about uh, specifically what makes Kenya so special that uh, this kind of innovation happened. And uh, the whole women thing, I can, we can, uh, I can touch upon that later. Um, but Kenya, like I mentioned, is a prepaid economy. And with the, uh, a lot of uh, the population has cell phones. And when I say cell phones, I'm not talking about smartphones. I'm talking about just cell phones, like the 3310, which is the indestructible phone. Like people, a lot of people have those kinds of phones. And um, with the lack of internet and the need for financial participation inclusion, uh, and the prepaid economy especially, M-Pesa has gained a lot of traction because um, folks need to make small payments. And like you, you know, when you're in a very isolated, unbanked area of the country. Um, there's really no way for you to participate in, in, in the economy. There's no way for you to buy goods and services. So M-Pesa has, like, like I said, with the, with, without using banks and without using ATMs, um, which are very hard to find in Kenya, they were able to capitalize on that and um, build a massive, like, uh, I don't even want to call it a company, it's a wave uh, of payments infrastructure that didn't exist before. So there was a huge gap in the market that no one really understood or no one really, people tried to fix it, adding more ATMs, building more bank uh, locations, but um, M-Pesa was what, and this model has actually been d duplicated and replicated across uh, sub Sub-Saharan Africa and India as well. Um, and it's, you know, things like Venmo, I'm sure were inspired by, <laughs> by the success of M-Pesa. Uh, one more question? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll do one more. Where, well, you can maybe sit in the yeah. seat so we can pretend it's a full panel question. <laughs> but uh, still. All right. So now it's time for full panel questions. Can I get that one where related question? Cool. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you've seen uh, any kind of significant movement on Bitcoin or any other blockchain related currencies in Kenya or any other African countries. All right. So the question's about Bitcoin in Kenya? Yeah. Uh, so. There's still like Bitcoin, like it is around the world. It's still not as ubiquitous as most would like it to be, uh, but yes, there is uh, like Bitpesa in Kenya, which is allowing Kenyans to buy Bitcoin with their M-Pesa. Um, and uh, actually, recently Nigeria, I think they lifted the ban, but they recently blocked all digital currencies coming to their bank because uh, Bitcoin, before blockchain, I guess, was untraceable, and it was funding a lot of uh, terrorist organizations like Al Shabaab and and the Boko Haram. Uh, so, yes, there has been some advancements in Bitcoin and, and blockchain in Africa, but it's still finding its legs. So, yeah. Great. Um, all right. Uh, now I'll just invite questions from the room. Uh, in the back. Um, this question is for Rika. Um, hi, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the, uh, the connection of angelic theological uh, conceptions within the re-enchantment project and the, the technological and digital re-enchantment project. So a question about how angels fit in to the sort of things I was outlining. So, um, yeah, so the stuff I presented kind of emerged out of, um, I just was reading Donna Haraway's uh, Manifesto for Cyborgs, and um, I'd done a bunch of work on Dionysus the Areopagite, who's the first systematic angelologist in the Christian tradition. So he like decides exactly sort of how all the angels are ranked and ordered. And it just struck me that there were some kind of interesting analogies between the figure of the angel and Christian theology, which becomes this kind of, becomes a way of um, asking a lot of questions about what it means to be human, about what it means to work, 
Um, angels are essentially bureaucrats, so they manage the world on behalf of God, and then they gather up worship instead of taxes. So I just sort of got interested in the analogy between angels and cyborgs, and then I guess as I sort of... So I, I think the, the, the figure of the cyborg does something similar, like it is this kind of figure that's human and yet not quite human, so it both helps us think about what it means to be human and not cyborg, but also what we might become or what we might be being transformed into. Um, and so I guess what I outlined was a way of sort of setting the bigger context in which I think that analogy emerges. So I think because of the way that, uh, I guess the thing I have in mind is, um, I think Schmidt's idea that um, all contemporary political concepts are liquidated theological concepts. So the way that, that you have this kind of set of theological structures that get sort of chewed up and then re-emerge in new ways in late capitalism. And so, yeah. I've just talked a bunch around that question, so I hope it's kind of vaguely answered. <laughs> Thank you. I love that idea of the angels as bureaucrats. Um, another question. Uh, is there anyone else? Yeah. Uh, so you talked about um, unpaid labor, mm -hmm. and you talked about debt, and you talked about serving tech billionaires, but I imagine you're all active on social media still, so how do you kind of mentally do that, or why, or? Barely, for myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the question was, why are we still on social media? Yeah. <laughs> That's basic. Um, well, I think that there's a difference between um, completely banning something from your life and being aware of it. And I think for me, the biggest thing is this awareness that there's a difference between social, institution, uh, social interaction and institutional interaction. Because I think this idea of lurking or creeping that becomes very kind of colloquial and, and kind of the terms we use to almost shame people um, are, are kind of detrimental because they completely cover up and make even more invisible all of the labor. And so I think if you're aware of it, then you then you know where your data are going. But I always tell people we're so worried about buying stuff and having valuable things and having nice glasses and a purse and a nice car, but the most valuable thing by far we own uh, are our data. And yet we just lurking-wise, we give it away all the time. So I think it's an awareness of the first step. And that's my way to say I still use social media. This <laughs> 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 is something that I've um, been thinking about uh, kind of in the, in the debt context, you know, thinking about the movement and um, the debt strike kind of move, uh, act, activist movement, uh, which seeks to kind of um, ultim ultimately suggests that our power as, you know, as the indebted um, lies in our, you know, our ability to kind of withhold, pay you know, payment if we do it in, in mass. Um, um, and, I want, and, and I'm wondering if there's some sort of equivalent of this in capital, you know, with, with respect to our relationship to capitalist social media or our engagement with capitalist social, you know, social media, if there's some sort of just, uh, you know, a mass, uh, um, just imagining, not, you know, not, thinking about this as a, uh, a practical thing necessarily, but imagining what a mass strike, social media strike might, you know, might look like, you know, the, the parallel kind of a, uh, the, the, the ideal of a death, a death strike as a form of resistance. Um. And I guess I just think there's no one of the ways in which capitalism is like religion and it, there's no outside of it. You can't get out of the world that capitalism creates, you can't get out of the world that God creates, so you're in it, and the question is how do you use it, and I think that interesting thing about magic um, is that it doesn't resist God by denying God, it just tries to use those networks of connection in different ways, and so I think that my experience of social media is clearly you are caught up in those systems that to some extent reinscribe power, but it also, you can use it in ways that start to create networks of solidarity that you can then weaponize, I guess. But there's no purity, and I think we need to kind of recognize that. No. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, answer your own question that you ended with. Uh, what does it look like to build weird, witchy, heretic uh, networks of solidarity? Uh, do you have any? Uh, did I get that right? Any... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I left it as a question because I don't know what the answer is yet. Um, no, I think I just don't know what the answer is yet. I'm trying to work out what the question is to ask. 
uh, and then try and figure out the answer. But I think something about that, something like that question is the the one that I want to kind of work through. Is like how do we, um, yeah, uh, how do we take the connections that exist and turn them for our own ends and use them as forms of resistance instead of just being kind of passively caught up in them. Um, and yeah. How do you do that? And one thing I was thinking about actually was that, again, one of the things that's interesting about um, heresy and witchcraft is that it, I feel like when people talk about witchcraft in the contemporary world, it's often this kind of deliberately oppositional thing. So, uh, yeah, so you kind of do witchcraft as a form of kind of resistance to theology. But I think there's something interesting going on sometimes because actually a lot of the people who get uh, prosecuted as witch witches or heretics, like they just really sincerely believe that they are like doing the right thing religiously and so maybe maybe it's partly about not just even not even just not even just resistance but actually just trying to build something else and try to work out what it looks like to worship in different ways to take other things as kind of the thing that's really valuable and sort of build stuff around that rather than just being directly oppositional um, yeah how do we worship different gods rather than how do we do heresy on purpose something like that um. Do you see another question in the back? Yeah. Um, for my first hands in the Angela. Song, what's your name? Angela. Um, you had um, a lot of great data about how people use public Facebook statuses and how they mm -hmm. react. Um, do you have any data on whether my research is in women's networks of care, mm. especially trans women's networks of care, but how people use private things, so chats, etc., how emotional labor played out differently mm -hmm. in, for example, private Facebook groups versus. Mm -hmm. Public ones. Obviously, you talked about Snapchat, but mm -hmm. do you have any other data about the other networks? So the question is, do I have data about more private about messaging? How, how or it just breaks it down across the privacy boundary. Okay, for for the for the different granularity. I let me think. Not not necessarily from from the data set that I mostly pulled from today, but clearly, as you mentioned, just seeing how Snapchat is is kind of flips the expectations on uh, their heads a little bit. I think probably speaks to that. But from previous research, I do know that people will comment that the reasons they make certain decisions about which apps to use, which platforms to use, and which privacy settings to use um, always are based in that they think they're more private. It's, it's a huge part. I think it's more private. And again, they're really just talking about social privacy. Um, so I think that something like, you're right, something like Facebook Messenger is interesting because it feels more private because you're not posting, but you're not socially posting. So no, I don't have anything discreet um, to report on that, but I definitely think there's something there, and it shows the further bifurcation of the social versus the institutional. Yeah. Yeah, go for it. I have a question for you. Um, did you look at uh, less, um, I guess, less mainstream uh, social networks like Peach, for example? So I had, mm. I actually did not limit to what they could choose. Uh, the top four were the ones that presented. There was a little bit on Reddit and a little bit on Tumblr, but for the most part, um, everyone responded to one of those four, and unfortunately, um, only one of my respondents um, noted that they performed non-binary gender. So my sample was mostly those four popular social media sites, um, and mostly people who just perform as male or female. So. Yeah. Uh, for Ricky, um, so you mentioned debt resistance. Are there other kind of interesting takes on how to kind of uh, combat this kind of system of debt uh, that that you've come across in your research? Um, so the question is, is what um, besides debt resistance, debt strike, what you know, what other kind of forms of resistance to you know, to debt might there might there be? That's a yeah, that's a that's a great and an, an important question, yeah. I guess because, as kind of a small addition to that, because you mentioned that you have critiques of microloans, which I imagine would be a way to like only further that same system. So what? So, so it, it just leaves this big question of like what is left. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, at least kind of draw, drawing going back to. to Mountain and Harney's work, you know, and they're they're thinking a lot about uh, of the global south as well, and thinking about the you know, bringing you know bringing in more credit to the you know, to the global south, and what resistance to that could look like, and 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 why you know why it's so important, and I think that 
Um, I mean, they have some beautiful, you know, some beautiful lines that I can't quote for, you know, for for Beatum about, um, you know, about the power of just withholding, you know, uh, withholding payment, um, withholding debt, trading, you know, making, you know, uh, accepting that debts, you know, are un, un you know, can and should be un rendered unpayable, and you know, just trading, you know, trading debts with other debt, you know, debtors. Um, and again, it's you know, it's. It, go, it comes all back to them just to withholding, you know, withholding payments, um, striking, which of course only works. Um, go back to the social media question, the earlier social media question as well. Only works if you're engaged in the system. Right? A debt strike is only useful if you have, if if you owe money, right? if you have, if you have debt. Um, so you have to engage with the system in order to, in order to kind of have any power with, you know, power within it. Um, but again, I, I, it's, I, I'm sorry that I'm not, I'm not answering your question. But just kind of reiterating, you know, reiterating. Yeah. Have you studied it at all obfuscation as a means of resistance, um, as opposed to uh, obscurity in social media? And I'm, this is kind of a question for several people, I suppose. But instead, uh, overwhelming the system and, and, and sending noise, as opposed to so in that way, not engaging with the system. Yeah. So the question's about about obfuscation and kind of creating noise in this you know noise in the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, for identity-wise, I think that's a really tough question because I think it's really easy for us to say something like you you can do whatever you want when you're on Instagram. You can you can post whatever photo you want. You can like whatever. You can do anything to obscure your identity. But at the end of the day, people take that very seriously. That is just one other part of them. So when we're talking about identification, it's tough because that is your art, that is a part of you. So to try to obscure it is to feel as if you're obscuring yourself and you get you get lost in that. So I think that's a really difficult question. So I don't know, something in your context may be a little different. But, yeah. um, I can speak to what you, what you said about, uh, you know, Attacking a system, I guess, making creating noise versus uh, stepping back and like just withholding. I think the act of stepping back and like, especially in participation, I think is a very privileged position to take, where you're able to be like, I'm not gonna participate because I can't, because I because I don't want to. Not um, so like for example, I'm gonna use what what I said before about prepaid economy and about how in Kenya people are paying for their internet with like cash that they receive in their paycheck today. And they, it's a pay-as-you-go system, so like they'll get what 50 hertz or whatever of, of, of electricity. Um, they, you can't, they can't, they're not, they, they're not able to step away. And uh, but then still, Mcopa, the company that that, uh, that sells them the solar power, is taking down their information, and is you know there's a lot of data around this. So I, it's 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 very tough for most most marginalized, I guess, most marginalized communities to step away. It's kind of everyone has has to like lean into, um, so I I really don't know how change could, I, I don't know if we not, I don't know if I have the answers, but uh, yeah, how we can create change by either stepping away or making noise. Uh, all right, and we are actually a little bit over, so I want to just uh, if you have a final word to say on that, but uh, in general we should probably clear out. Okay, great. Uh, give the panelists a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>